just wait till, wait till it pops up. Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Ellis, the cable lead at Cathy. And I'm here to talk about uh, an innovation in early stage project development reporting. Uh, this is me. This is a tweet from last year when I joined Cathy and um, I've put some virtual stickers on the container wall there to show companies I've worked directly for. And um, it shows the experience I've brought to the cable lead position in Cathy and to specifically the construction technical advisory and management um, department, if you like, which um, which is the area which I, I came in to develop a little bit further, as well as looking after all the other cable projects. And this particular discussion here is about cable protection engineering and how we feel it can be developed a little bit further from the standard work that we currently do. So the ICPC recommendation number nine, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, is minimal technical requirements for desktop study. It's often the first step in assessing route viability. And whilst it identifies the hazards and risks associated with one or several route options at an early phase, it doesn't and is not intended to deliver a full strategy for the protection of cables. And so the key objective of the Cable Protection Analysis Report, or CPAR, alongside nomination and recommendation of options for installation burial techniques, uh, is to take into account current market contractors, equipment and methodologies, and the risks and commercial aspects thereof. With the proliferation of new power and telecoms cables projects, developers and transmission network operators often do not have the in-house capability to understand both risks and installation mitigation options. So to impart them into their cost benefit analysis at the early development stage. And the CPAR gives us a familiar name to collate in the inputs of the desktop study, the barrel assessment study, and an installation feasibility study, which may be performed separately for the commercial and risk side of events. And beyond that, importantly for the CPAR, it gives us a better uh, definition of physical and commercial risks going into the RFQ and ITT stage, as well as refining the survey recommendations which follow on. In line with the premise of DNV Recommended Practice 101 for risk management in marine subsea operations and the subsea power cables recommended practice, the installation risks and challenges are collated and thus commencing a technically validated RMP for the client at the earliest stage. We feel this is important to pull all this together. So from the beginning, subsea power cables are, as we know, critical yet vulnerable parts of any offshore project. And utilizing the combination of geotechnical, geophysical, GIS and various modeling resources, the engineering team can take a point to point provision from a developer and initially optimize the cable routes from open source data. And while this approach is familiar to probably all of you here, it's a collation of all following items which I'm going to talk about into one report, which is the perceived benefit of the CPAR. So this schematic plots an offshore wind farm export, which we'll um, focus on a little bit rather than interconnectors and telecoms, um, from an onshore substation to an offshore substation. And the uh, CPAR will consider each of these zones separately in separate sections and pull out the challenges within them for a particular project. So starting with the onshore grid connections, the CPAR understands the requirements at the transition joint bay location for the subsea to onshore connection and works from there to discuss the options for taking the cable offshore. So limitations of geomorphology, geology, consents, and environmental concerns will lead to either a HCD trendless solution or a trench solution in the TJB up to a location where the offshore cable lay vessel can commence in suitable working depths. And it's the optioneering, which is for want of a better word, of these critical items which at this stage can be performed to, uh, to give you a better risk aspect. Uh, so at this point of nomination of vessel and trenching options will be made. Um, it's important not to rule out any option as opportunities vary between contractors. And importantly, in global locations and the availability of vessels locally. And that's important that these studies are performed for the local conditions, not just the geotechnical ones, but the actual market in the area. Um, 
example is extreme lengths of shallow water leading to long sections of deep water is obviously not applicable for the same vessel. So it may require multiple solutions and therefore joints, etc., along the way. And identifying these early are important for cost and electrical design cases. Moving further offshore, the identification of significant issues such as hard substrate, rock crossings, potential boulders, wrecks, sandbanks, shipping channels and so on is going to draw up more risks and enable provisional idea of how to tackle them and indeed price them effectively. And then the offshore wind farm area may be tackled separately or within the main SEPA. And since we know usually exports and array construction projects are required to be separate in most Northern European developments anyway, it's expected that a CPAR export and a CPAR array would be produced. Specific consideration in the array area will, of course, be the type of structure to connect into. But importantly, this location, as we know, especially further afield, may have multiple requirements for different vessels and trenching solutions. So the contents of the CPAR split really into two sections, an assessment section and analysis section. So firstly, the assessment will be split into site description, we'll look at the regional geology, the seabed conditions, a list of theirs is familiar to most of us, bathymetry, etc. Landfall, the shallow geology for trenching, and then a zonation, so critically in bathymetry and geohazards. You can then draw on that the installation methodology and the trenching methodology. So the landfall feasibility being, being most important to begin with, is that going to be HDD or, or, um, or with a trench? Um, we can then look at performing profiles, calculations, and all types of landfall pulling solutions. Um, the near shore pulling feasibility will be looked at with vessel options and protection options if, uh, if required. And then the cable design risks for the landfall location. So if it's going to be a deep HDD and there's some considerations on thermal characterization or some considerations on um, pulling forces. Um, then if you look at trenching and protection, this early stage we can give a provisional target trench depth so that we can then pull out some BAS tables and anticipate performances, which allows us to characterize further what types of equipment can be used um, and where trenching isn't applicable crossings, etc., can be considered different options, their impact on cable rating of both the new cable and the cable's crossing, and then other remedial or planned non-burial protection options. So in the analysis part then, we'll look at the risk, the geohazards, such as a zebra risk in general, we're not actually performing a zebra, but we understand very well, of course, all of us what zebra risks are involved with, and impart that into trenching risks. Installation risks will be covered in landfall, installation, trenching and protection sections. And then finally, an O&M risk analysis. So are we going to leave the cable and is there going to be any latent risk to pass on to either off toes or O&M um, parties? Commercial analysis. Well, provisional costs should be drawn up for all scenarios from the landfall to the OSP. And these costs should be derived from the market research and a database of similar recent projects that whoever's producing this report should, should have. Um, and for array fields without a current layout, a cost heat mapping exercise could be drawn up, and I'll cover that a bit later in the presentation. After looking at all these parts, then there's potential for innovation. So following an understanding of the risks and, and budgeting, there could be gaps in the market for solutions which could be research for further development. Examples recently, uh, innovative deeper burial trenching solutions and um, issues with multiple cable crossings in congested locations. So the value of heat mapping, well, first of all, for routing, um, it's common to follow the DMV standard for routing, as you see below. As part of this, the heat mapping or zonation of these hazards can be drawn up to back macro route at this stage. And hard and soft constraints are characterized in the, in the cable route. And uh, it's possible, therefore, to uh, in early stage pass through these hopefully green low constraint patches on the heat map. Taking the heat mapping further into cost, and specifically on the array field here, 
Not to develop the cable installation element of an array field. A heat mapping exercise can be utilized as well as a cable sizing exercise within the heat map. So for the installation, the cost map might be comprised of several sublayers, such as installation costs with shallow water vessels and deeper water vessels. Burial costs for significant areas, such as sandbanks or sand waves, or rock, glacial till, etc. Um, slopes are important for tools, boulders, obviously, glacial till. And um, then finally, an O&M and repair costs. So what are you going to be left with? In areas, um, they might have a, a more specific high potential risk for O&M later. So in order to do this, the map split into four meter cells. The cells are given cost factor scores. And in the best case, you'll see the cost factor is one. And each layer adds a penalty onto the top of this, and the overall score is obviously the, the sum of the layers. A few examples here. So a trenching example, the table layer, um, cost factor penalty zero, where we consider depth of less than two meters of normal trenching, so perhaps in a reasonable sand or soft clay. Um, but as the depth increases, the cost factor penalty increases with the requirement for extra passes or significant depths for uh, items like vertical injectors or dredging. And it's very specific that it's zoned into certain areas and the cost factor penalties in general based on additional mobilizations, bringing in extra equipment, weather, working additional pr parameters or constraints and uh, shallow water vessel constraints, etc. Um, based on slope angles, then uh, we know that these affect specific tools. And again, as the slope increases on the table layer, the cost factor penalty increases, um, resulting in the final cost factor being where there's possibly only one solution, such as a vertical injector. And again, the penalty is based on the additional normalization and uh, lesser working capabilities. And then we can have uh, an example here based on water depth and requirement to change from shallow water vessels to DP, deeper water vessels. And again, the cost factor is largely based on this mixing out of two solutions, additional mobilizations, etc. cetera. Um, here's an example then. So the excerpt shows an overall cost map of an area uh, with a sandbank. Um, one in blue is a baseline, and each colored increment is an additional cost for each layer as a cumulatively laid on, put on top of each other, um, including insulation, trenching, and the O&M elements as discussed. And you'll see either side of the sandbank, which is yellow and red in the middle, the cost factors are lower. So laying a cable, performing trenching between 27 and 68 is a significantly different cost between 68 and 30. And in that, this way, you can reroute or at least have a knowledge that that cost is going to be there. When we look at cable sizing, so we can also do that uh, controlled by two main variables. So burial depth, obviously depth of potential overburden, which is shown below. And thermal resistivity areas can also be characterized, which may be important for larger export routes. Uh, and the second variable is the load on the cable, and, and that's independent of the location on the site, but instead depends on the number of turbines exporting power over a particular link, for example, the place of the WTG in question along a given string. And you see that the yellow uh, constraints have larger requirement for larger conductor sizes to cope with those variables, and the hard constraint is really in the middle there where it's going to be above 1,000 millimetres square, which is in general outside of the current uh, practice for connection of um, uh, wind turbines in arrays. And so the production of a CPAR or CPAR will be undertaken by a senior level engineer with at least 10 years experience, cable installation, and uh, more pertinently, needs to be involved in active market research and gathering lessons learned from as many projects as possible across all different types of subject cables areas. And in addition, you'll need a heat mapping, uh, GIS specialist, and for the electrical works, a specialist engineer also. Conclusion then, um, the CPAR document is intended to cover 
cable lay installation scenarios, burial tool suitabilities, landfall cable installation, crossing and, project and protection design, budget, program, and cable electrical design considerations. We're pulling them all together, collation of those items into one report. At an early stage of development, it's going to allow all key stakeholders uh, to understand the risks and the costs in the program. And with the heat mapping on top, is going to allow them to manipulate layouts and installation cable designs as they go through the next stages of procurement. Um, hopefully this is intended to reduce the risk of over conservatism at the early stage in both engineering and design. Just a list of references that uh, we refer to here. So these are all commonly used in the industry, obviously, and um, and I think you'll be more than aware of them. And the CPAR should really be designed with these in the background in, in mind. That's the end of the presentation. Thanks very much. Um, Hope you found it uh, interesting. Of course, any questions um, we'll take after this. And here's my email address for anything further. Thank you very much.